I'm a you little wrinkly. Gray, I'm, right? a, I'm a little wrinkly. Okay. You're old yeah. and gray. Yeah. But that's who you are. That's who I am. That's Roberto Gallini. The, of the Gallini brothers. Oh. From the, How many brothers? This, the Sicilian Gallinis. It's a branch of the family into okay. Sicily. Entry music. Da, 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 da. It's the Bob and Josh show. You're super pumped about this company that you just talked to. You know they love you. You're excited for the offer. It shows up, but it's a lot less money. How did this happen? What can you do as a candidate to prevent it from happening? What if it does? How do you gracefully handle that situation? Bob and I walk you through how to handle this on both sides of the table. Number one, if it happens to you, handle this like a boss. We'll show you all the tips and tricks to make sure you navigate this nice and smoothly. Second, we help all the hiring folks make sure this doesn't happen. We also help make sure you see the warning signs that something like this could happen and what to do about it before you provide a candidate with a less than exciting experience. Nobody wants that. Just before we get started, you could know all of this already. All you had to do was show up on Friday morning at 11 a.m. while we recorded this live. We had fans from Twitch, LinkedIn, and YouTube all commenting away while we discussed this. We even used some of their content. As you'll probably notice within the episode, they helped shape the discussion. So you have options. If you want to be a part of the discussion and shape the episode, tune in, get in chat, let's make it awesome. Or you can just know all this early and have a leg up against your friends and drop some knowledge on them over the weekend. However you want to handle it, know that we're live on just about every platform we can think of. We'll see you there. Let's go get this episode. Here we go. I've got a good friend that had been with the company for a while and started to contemplate leaving and started to look at what was going on out there, found a company that they were excited about, went through the hiring process, got to the end, and the offer was significantly lower, uh, let's say $20,000 lower than what had been discussed with HR at the start of the process. So they called me and said, hey, this is weird. How would you handle this? What would you do? And should I just like walk away? It actually took them a while to get out that I feel insulted because it was talked about at the start of the process. And so now we've gone through this process and you've known the target seller that I had. So you're basically saying, hey, we don't think you're worth that. We actually think you're worth this and take it or leave it. This is the genesis of today's episode. And it's an interesting thing, especially with everything that's going on. And Bob and I have talked about generational differences around these types of things. Uh, I think what you'll find is that I was raised by the generation <laughs> that Bob is. So, so, so I started, <laughs> I'm sorry, Bob, I could, I couldn't say that another way. Um, so I was raised by people similar in age to my co-host and that's, uh, that's how I operated for quite a while. And then I began to evolve and have flip flop quite drastically. So that's the stage, Bob, it has been set. Is there anything you'd like to open with an open volley? I mean, the, the thing that comes to my mind initially is knowing what you're worth as you were talking i was i was noodling on maybe step one is is a step before this conversation is doing an assessment somehow getting data that says this is what i'm worth in my role uh in your current company and then in the market i know that may not be easy but you can network and things you know around that the other thing that's complementary to that is and maybe this is generational i don't know uh so i undervalue myself so part of my generational connection josh and you you know i'm not telling you anything yes yeah, right <laughs> that's a surprise i have a tendency to undervalue myself and to succumb to power plays organizational power plays right so the company trumps me right and if they if they say if i think i'm worth 50 and they say you're worth 20 i'm i'm gonna not succumb to it, but I'm going to listen to that. Oh, maybe they know something I 
you know, I don't know. So I think understand your market worth, but also I, I find that some generations inflate themselves. So there's some, I don't, and I'm not identifying which ones, but it's, you know, you can either, so there's, what is the market rate? And then what is my view of my worth too? Like what's my, what's, what's my perspective? And I think sometimes people can overvaluate themselves as well. Uh, and, and so don't, don't, don't go too high, right? Be, be realistic. So market, and then what is your view of self? Uh, it's self-awareness. I think you and I've talked about this in a Metacast once or twice. Uh, it what it wasn't a generational thing, but it was uh, just just folks folks highball, right? They they so it's like where is that middle ground? Any reactions to what I said? Yeah, the I, to me, I feel like highballing has become a defense mechanism to the lowballing, and then you you ultimately expect to end somewhere in the middle. And I do my darndest not to play that game in both directions. So that's a thing that I talk about up front during the hiring process, either if I'm going to hire or if I'm looking to be hired is get that out on, on the table and say, I am going to offer you exactly what I think you're worth in our world. And I'm not going to lowball you. That's going to be the number. Now, one thing when I'm hiring, I don't ever want to lose a candidate over a couple thousand dollars. Like if we've in, it, we've invested in this person, we know they are the fit. Right. And let's say that I say, hey, $100,000, that's what fits within our realm and is fair to the people that currently work here and have put in time. Um, and they come back and say, okay, well, I think I'm worth like 102. Like, okay, fine. Yeah, sure. At that point, that's 2%. That's, that's, that's right. not going to break the bank. Now you can't go willy nilly with that, but that's not worth losing someone over. Cause you've probably spent more than $2,000 getting that person through the process and getting them to hear where there's an offer. So don't be wasteful at that point and just say no to hold on to a number. Um, so I, I have always been frustrated by the whole process of offers and Earlier in my career, it was much harder to figure out what salaries were because they were always hush hush. There was no glass door. There was no LinkedIn. There weren't things like that that had started to gather data and help people understand what their worth is because it always felt like a crapshoot. It always felt like um, I'm I'm going to have to kind of guess what I think I'm worth, and it's even harder when the role you're getting hired for is different than the, than the one that you've had. So say you're moving into like a supervisor, manager, director role, whatever it is. Now you really have no freaking clue what pay should be. So I always felt like I was on my heels at that point. And I was always worried about asking for that crazy number and just having to be like, kid, get out of here. Uh, so, so those are thoughts and emotions that I've had throughout the process that kind of line up with some of the things that you said. I mean, one of the, my philosophies, I haven't hired folks for a while, but, um, but when I was hiring folks very actively, I had a, a leadership intent of always to delight them. Um, so I would always, and it wasn't always based on their number, Josh, it was, I mean, I considered their number, but let's say their number was outside of the ranges I could offer for whatever reason. Uh, and I would go and I would stretch it, but let's say I couldn't, I could only stretch it, you know, but I still couldn't meet their number. I, but I would, I would always try independent of that to put my best foot forward. So I'm not a good negotiator or, I, or, I, so I don't like bouncing back and forth and nickel and diming and folks. So I would look at the interview, look at the person, look at the market dynamics and say, I want, I want to wow them relative to my dynamics. I don't want to low, ball. so I think lowballing says something about the culture mm -hmm. and how you treat people. And I just don't like it. I, I would hide it again. I lost people because I couldn't compete with like the Googles of, you know, you can't compete with every, like, like some FinTech companies just throw golden handcuffs at people. Uh, and so you may not be able to compete with them, but I would, damn it. I would put my best foot. I was proud of every offer I made. 
I would have HR conversations to stretch things. Uh, the other thing I would do is I would also look at internal equity. So it wasn't that uncommon for me if I gave an offer that I had to do some internal equity adjustments. Mm -hmm. But but I, I looked at that whole thing as being, you know, fair. But put your best foot. I did. I I didn't want to negotiate with them, but I wanted to make a statement that, you know, I I wanted to value them. Like I wanted to hire them. Right. Otherwise, why are you making them an offer? Right. Do, do you have a Do you align with that? Yes, I, I, again, I, I want, so a lesson I learned is that everybody, except for maybe Bob Galen, believes they're worth more than they're getting paid, no matter what, no matter how much you're making, no matter how long you've been in the role, whatever, everybody feels like they should be making more. That is just a reality. It's a human condition. It's the world that we live in. I always feel that way. So I know everybody else is feeling that way again, except for Bob. Um, he's a unique person uh, that is special to us all. <laughs> I mean, I'm not. <laughs> Give me a dollar, Josh, and I'll do anything you want. <laughs> Come but on, Josh. There's, there's, um, there's a, there's a couple interesting dynamics ab about just the world of work and your pay. That when this person came to me we we talked about and there is it, it it is significantly harder to get a significant raise once you're in a company versus going and acquiring a new position so it's it's like this this is the number that you're coming in with and beyond your normal you know three percent five percent raise on a regular basis that will keep up with inflation maybe um that that it's going to be hard to go get that 15 percent, 20 percent effort uh sorry that 15 to 20 percent increase that you feel or have actually earned as you've grown in that role so you have to understand that and make sure that you're comfortable how you're setting yourself up for the next n number of years the other thing that goes along with that is this terribly frustrating world of what's your current salary? Yeah. And that's always an unfair question because the circumstances aren't the same, but also you have to understand that how you start because of that. And as you grow in your career, you become more and more willing to talk around and through that issue. But that initial number that's your baseline. And then you're only building on top of that. You likely aren't going to be able to just double it because of all of the factors. And you might not be confident enough having that discussion with the VP or whoever that, Hey, I get that I made 50 and you want to offer me, you know, 55, but I actually believe I'm worth 70. You know, there, there's a lot of companies that just like, well, no, you know, like it's not even, they don't even look at, what you're worth in the market. It's like, Hey, what did you make? And then we'll pay you a little bit more. And that should be enough to make you happy. And that's a, those are real world things that we talked through when this person was starting to um, try and deal with this. And then the other thing yeah. I want to talk about that you brought up is I hear a lot of companies, a lot of people, and even companies that I worked with that said, Oh, we can't compete with, Google or here in Raleigh, it's IBM or Red Hat or whatever those companies are. And I said, whether you like it or not, you are. So you have to compete with these people, especially now because the market is global. Because after the pandemic, so much has changed. And now your employees can go work for Google and live here, wherever here is for, for you. So you are competing with them whether you like it or not. So play the game and get in there. And if you want to hire well, then you've got to make some stuff happen. And you may have to think about the way you compensate, the way you recruit, all of those things, because you're competing no, but, with them right now. I Let's separate, are you competing with them in, from, do you have to change your behavior uh, to 100% match them? So there are, you know, let's be real, Josh. There, there are there are fintech companies in this area who are offering like 100% bonuses. 
right? And thing and, and things like that of salary, right? So if I make two hundred thousand, I'm getting two hundred thousand a year, or I'm getting seventy percent or sixty percent. There are few, right? They're they're fintech, right? They maybe they they're flush with cash pre recession, and and I, I does every small startup does every moderate middle size does I do? Yes, are they competing with them? Yes, uh, do they have to hit? Hundred percent bonuses. I, is that is that prudent for them, given their financial? I, I I'd say no. Like realize I, what you're real. Realize well, this is where I'm at. This is my stretch. Push yourselves. I think that's what you're saying. Push yourselves hard, mm -hmm. but don't try to be Fidelity or this bank or that bank or whatever. What what? I'm I mean I'm not bringing up names, but you, you don't have bring to. Up names. Yeah, and I'm trying to withdraw it. <laughs> I'm trying. To, I'm trying to withdraw it. But so, uh, uh, you know what I, you know, I, so I'm, I'm sort of adding nuance to what you said, because I actually think it would be asinine to, to try to compete with everyone directly. Uh, and which is then going to dilute your headcount, you know, your effectiveness. I don't know. The other thing is it's not just tech hires, it's the effect. And you know, this, it, there's a lot of nuance to this behind the scenes because it's going to disrupt salary ranges across the company. It's potentially, so it's not just tech tech equity. It's what does that mean to the accounting team? Are they lesser citizens? What does it mean to the customer support team? I'm not saying we have to be sort of held hostage by them, but you have to be aware of company equity as well. Yeah. Yes. But that again <laughs> is a reality of life. So I am not saying that everybody can compete monetarily. But I have seen and heard so many companies that will just throw their arms up in the air and say, we can't compete with them, so we're not going to change at all. And at that point, you've chosen you're going to lose. Maybe not right away, but you're going to lose over time. And, okay, so if the salaries really have jumped up to 150000 and you're only paying 100000 you're going to stick to it because that's who we are and we're not going to compete with those, then you have to accept that you're likely going to have a less talented pool of people forget the role whatever it is versus versus going out and paying to get someone with more experience direct experience whatever it might be you have to accept reality around who you are at that point and many people don't and they they expect people to want to work for them at a reduced rate and one of the issues that I see with so many leaders is nobody is going to care and give to your company as much as you are. Yet many CEOs expect employees to operate like that. But no one is going to operate at that level because the context, the responsibility, the, the, the heartache you've poured in to just get things started, that no one else can replicate that. But still, there are people that expect that. And so those are challenges I've seen across the industry as well. I mean, you have an extreme or, I mean, you have your view yeah. and it's based on your experience. I, I'm trying to bring some other balancing acts. Yeah, I'm not, exactly. I'm That's not really disagreeing. Yeah, I'm not disagreeing with you. Someone brought up on the in the chat that money is poor, but it's not everything. When I listen to you, it sounds like money is everything or it's, I, I'm putting words in your mouth and I'm, it's not fair, mm -hmm. but it's like 90, the way I hear your intonation and your discussion is money is 90% of the focus. You got to get your, you got to get paid early because they'll hose you later, et cetera, stuff like that. Okay. That's, that's a part of it. But what about opportunity? Mm -hmm. What about showing someone? Like again, get all your money, get all your get all your funds up front, uh, because you're going to get nickel and dime on raises. Well, that's a view. What if you go in and knock it out of the freaking park? What if they realize you're a rock star, which is what you were expect, which is what you were saying up front, mm -hmm. and then they pay you? I'd be stupid as a leader not to pay someone who's a rock star and give them nickel and dime increases over time. But instead of hiring them in as a rock star, they came, they came in maybe at market or maybe slightly below. Uh, they liked our culture. They liked our leadership. They liked that we were walking our talk. They liked our customer base. Very often, if you're doing things that matter to the world, they don't have the funds to pay top salaries, but 
but what you're doing matters like the bill gates foundation if i'm doing software for the gates foundation one of the one of the sort of the the, the factors for me would be this this work matters to the human race potentially right now i still don't want to work for jerks and i'm still not going to work for bob gale and rates of a dollar a day or whatever <laughs> whatever it is but but it's a multi i i it almost yeah. sounds like there's a generation that's too money focused and, so, and i'm looking for more balance yeah i i i have learned the chasing money fallacy i have done that in my career i understood some of the things you sacrificed to get there and i've learned that i don't want to sacrifice those things so i i it is not at the top of the list right now but why i focus on this is this is the one thing that's a part of the hiring process that you actually have control over you don't have control over the market that they're in or the culture that they have there's nothing you can do about it you either like it or you don't and there's Correct. nothing that can really be happening unless you're coming in a very high role you can shape things but still those are what they are and you found that company and there is no wiggle room that just is but the monetary compensation piece, that's where you have the capability to drive a little bit more. So that's why I focus mostly on that, especially I, in this I talk. I would agree. Because yeah, would, those are kind of static. Well, not only that, how people handle that, because it's such a sensitive, interesting place, like for folks who are negotiating that or going in and interviewing looking at the whole process of how are they handling the money how is the recruiter handling the money the discussions mm -hmm. how are they handling my current salary right what am i currently making how are they handling that question are right. they even asking that question how are they handling the negotiation are they doing the bob thing of putting their best foot forward or are they not doing that right are they stretching i mean do you get that sense are they even identifying the intangibles for you um uh, and being fair handed about that. Yeah. I, I, I would agree. It, it is one of those, I hadn't thought of it that way, but the whole, I'm going to call it the money thing is a really good window into the culture of the company yeah. and, yep. and the valuation, right? Yeah. How they, it, how they value you. Right. It, because again, there's all of those niceties. There's the ping pong table. There's the snacks. Those have become almost ubiquitous at this point now that was pre-pandemic when being in the office it was what are the perks how's you know how many monitors do i get things like yep. that where yep. um those are a couple hundred bucks um it, it's it, but it gets down to how do they value people and one of the comments that is in the chat is one of the things i've had to fight against the most is you you go down the route that Bob has talked about where you hire somebody in that's junior and you are betting on them and you think they're going to be great. And guess what? You were right. And they are great. And then you have to really work to get them the money that they have now grown into and loosening that up because so often your um, end of the year money is based on a single percentage a couple percentage points that get smeared across the entire company. And so now you have to figure out how, how to manage that. And oftentimes you don't, you aren't able to get the money, except if it's a truly exceptional piece. And then one of the most frustrating things, and this is why I never accept a counter offer is uh, that when you talk about leaving all of a sudden there's money like, Oh, now, Oh, now, I'm right. worth an extra $15,000 because you think I might walk out the door. Like, no, if you really thought that, then you would have, you would have come with that sooner. So those are the frustrations that I have where one of the challenges historically, and maybe this is just the path that I have tor towards here, but it felt as if the employee being hired had no leverage no say it was hey you come work for us at this price this is who we are we're not going to give you any more data this is just it take it or leave it and what i i try and do is i try and flip it there of reality is there's lots of companies that one could go work work for and getting people to think like that 
Um, yes, that's scary to say and to put yourself out there. I understand that. But you have to understand, especially today's market is starting to prove well with all the layoffs, it's lessened, but there, but but there was a period where it was clear companies needed more people than were out there. And maybe they overate, not maybe, but they clearly did. And now they've had to make some layoffs and that's, you know, rock some, some worlds, which is uncool, but with that unresponsible hiring, but still you have a say, you can represent what you're worth and you don't have to just take it or leave it. Now, there are situations. I was there, uh, let's see, six months ago when the startup that I was working for, we decided we had to shut it down. I just needed a daggone job like the next day to pay the bill. So I, I couldn't expect anything special. I had to understand where I was in right. life, what was going on and what is reasonable right. for me at this moment. And right. it was, I took a 30% pay, pay cut just to pay the bills. And so now then I've, I've got to work and make that up. I think one of the things you said that, that inspired or triggered a thought is, and it's not the afterwards, it's as leaders actively navigating, negotiating inside. So there's a step before, the, like there's ranges. So one of the reasons I was pushing back on you a little bit earlier is like, it, it's not, it's not actually hypothetical organizations define salary ranges. You know this, Josh, mm -hmm. right? Whether we like the ranges or not, whether we think they're artificial or not, they're there, they're established. Usually they're reevaluated on an annual basis or some periodic basis. Uh, budgets apply to percent increases or, for that. Uh, and then that's your pool. That's your, that's your pool of direct funding and maybe some discretionary funding to to handle new hires and to handle increases. So it's it's not a, someone picking it out of thin air. There's constraints is what I'm saying. Yeah. Now, there, yeah, what, right. you, what you can do as a leader, and a lot of leaders are lazy. They like actually, they succumb to that system. They take what the system gives them annually. They, and they don't, they're thankful for, for whatever 1% raise they got. But you can, you can challenge that. I bet you've done this. You've oh, challenged, yeah. you can challenge the data that they're using to establish ranges. You can give them, I've actually given them salary, you know, like incoming data of people's salary. One of the good things about sharing existing salaries is you can identify gaps, right? These are our ranges. And guess what? We can't find someone that fits into our ranges. We have to make an adjustment. So you can do that with, with market data, or you can do that with individual sample data with both, but you're actively doing that uh, as a leader before. So you're creating space, you're challenging the system or the status quo. And I think you do have to do that in technology, if that, if that makes sense. The other thing is as a leader, don't do the peanut butter spread thing, which is what I call, like you get a 5%, we get a 5% annualized increase. And, and a lot of leaders will just take that Plus or minus, there'll be like three point five, <laughs> but they'll, they'll so they don't have to make deci hard decisions. They'll just give everyone the same thing, and then they'll blame the man, right? Yep. Oh, right, it's their it's yeah. their fault, right? This is what I was given. There's no wiggle room. This is room. what I would, if yeah. I had to die for every time I heard that from a leader. Yeah. Leaders are reported. I'm like, don't say that, right? This is what I was given, so I'm just, I had no control. No, you have. There's a lot of discretionary range, both on the put pressure on the organization side and in using the funds that you do have effectively, yeah. right? Would you yeah. agree or just? Yeah, and one of the things, again, in those situations where I have pushed and I found out, oh, there's this secret undocumented slush fund over here <laughs> that's that, true actually right that like yeah. a ceo or a president has that they kind of have allocated for situations yeah. like this and you have no idea how big it is there's nothing it's nope. just like well when i deem it reasonable i'm going to sprinkle some of this magic over you well, and take, your it. Team. take it take it take it yeah Josh. take it yeah. and use it right yeah. yeah but like that's always been frustrating so yeah it's just one of those things actually where... actually I'm, i call that i mean i'm agreeing with you but it's it's common in most yep. organizations to have discretionary funds. They're not hidden, but they're not talked about. Right. People create buffers 
discretionary funds. I call managers discretion. Every Any manager listening to this needs to challenge the organization. You're not pushing back. What you're doing is you're you're looking at that 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 wiggle area called manager's discretion. You should try to exercise your discretion to do more. See what happens. You may get pushed back, but if you don't say anything, you'll never get into that. Right. <laughs> you'll never get exposed to the slush fund that Josh was talking about. Yeah, yeah. So that so that's always one of those things. Like, oh, there's this secret thing that only two people know about, and you know, every once in a while they open the door. So I, I do, do want to. Go, Ooh, go, go, go. Can I, I want to come back to the opportunity, the betting on yourself, yeah. Yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, it, the, the sports metaphor, Josh, you and I were talking before Aaron, I don't know about Aaron judge. Is it for the Yankees? Yeah. Um, so like Aaron the, those judge people, was, uh, his contract was, was ending and the Yankees wanted to get it, get him locked and loaded for like the next decade. They extended an offer before this previous season. He said, no, thanks. I'm not going to sign a long-term offer right now. Let's see how this season goes, and then we'll talk after that. Well, he goes and hits 62-plus homers in a season, which hasn't been done without performance-enhancing drugs ever. So he has a uh, record-breaking season because he bet on himself, and he didn't take that pay at that moment. So now the deal that he has is much larger than it was at the start of the year because he was already a great player, but he proved he might be a generational player by doing what, what, what he's done. And so he bet on himself and, and, and won. So there are times when you can do that and I've done that and I've done it quite often. Um, but then the hard part is, that back end making the monetary compensation align with what right. you've become because you don't have a contract that gets renegotiated every n number of years. It's just you're there. But I, I do think there, and this goes back to the folks that are too money centric, you know, and again, it's all blended, it's all situational, but it's the bet, it's, it is valid to bet on yourself. You see it in football, et cetera. The I have value, but they may not see it. And they don't suck, right? They may not see it. So show and then and then go for it, right? Now you you aptly said that one of the hard things there is having these hard conversations later on to get folks to realize, hey, my I've upped my value. Now yeah. I've I've done that on occasions. I've joined a company as an agile, you know, as a one company is a lowly agile coach scrum master, meta scrum master. And I ended up leaving their engineering organization. That was never my intention, uh, but it was it was one of those it was one of those things that the performance, uh, you know, show them. I, I wasn't worried. And again, I'm as Josh has pointed out, everyone. I am the one lone person who doesn't care much about money. But I was like, oh, just just pay me pay me in fruit, <laughs> and that's okay. Uh, so and I joined, but then then I got comp. I got paid but it was based on performance and it was a different thing. It wasn't me trying to, to promise something. I, I had anecdotal evidence that said, I can do this. I can not only do this, look yeah. at what I did. Look at the results. There's something to be said for balancing between those two things. I've Agreed. seen folks uh, real quick, Josh, I've seen folks go in and they take less and they work less is what mm -hmm. I'm saying. Right. Yeah. They're like, they're, they're not paying me. I joined as a, you know, I'm, I'm getting super developer money. And let me use you as an example. You said you took a job as a scrum master. Mm -hmm. I I know you brought every aspect of yourself to that job. I know yep. it for sure. And you didn't get caught up in the I'm making 30% less. To right. And that's that's a danger sometimes in in doing that low. You want to bring your whole self, I think. Go ahead. The so when I've bet on myself, I also in in accepting that role. I, I also knew there's going to be a couple of outcomes that are possible here. One, I'm going to, I'm going to knock out of the park like I expect to do. And then either they recognize that I help them see it and we adjust and I stay here and grow, or I attempt that I succeed. They don't recognize it. They don't want to pay. And then I'm going to have to leave. But those N number of years 
have given me experience and lessons learned and all types of things that I can now take to market and show an increased value that I have. So whether it's there or that company, there's still tremendous value yep. in betting on yourself in a role like, like whatever, um, that maybe isn't the direction you thought that you were going to go. But if it gives your career additional tools to put in your tool belt that you, that you know you can get a return on in the next five yep. years, then that's totally worth it. Absolutely. There's some counter offer discussions happening in the chat. Mm -hmm. I, I wonder counter offers like, like the, the, you know, the five word answer from you first, good, bad, take them, not take them counter offers. I don't make counter offers. I don't accept them. Ah, every metacasters ditto. I can't we're, we're and we didn't, we didn't pre-practice this. I, and, and we're not trying to tell, I don't, I have, I, I don't make them and I don't accept them. Yeah. Uh, why, why, why for you? I, I'm uh, trying to tangibly think of the why for me. So uh, the why for me on when I'm the person losing someone is 100% driven by the times when I've said, Hey, I'm moving on. And now that slush fund, that magical pot of money opens up all of a sudden, even though I've had the hard discussions with the company, the leader, whatever saying, Hey, this is, this is what I think I'm worth. And can we talk through it? And like the answer is no, it goes up the chain and down the chain and it comes back. No. Then all of yep. a sudden you say, Hey, I'm leaving. I was like, well, wait a minute. Let us, you know, let it's counter offer. So I don't want to be that person that when that happens, that if I've had, if I've had good discussions with that person and I value them, then I expect that we, we will have adjusted along the way. But there have been times just like some of the stuff that Bob talked about when this episode started, where they are getting a huge bump and I think they're worth it. And I know we're not going to match it. So I'm not going to waste anybody's time trying to play that game. I always felt, and I think you've said it, I always felt like the work should have been done and mm -hmm. it wasn't done and it's too late. And this is a principal thing for me. Like for example, giving yeah. it, Right. It's like I, we should have we should have had these discussions earlier. Very often I'm like surprised, like no one has talked to me as a leader. So if someone is leaving and I feel inclined to give a count, even if it's one of the most critical people on the planet, it's not personal. I'm like you, you've you've handcuffed me to the very end. And I wish we would have had this come tell me earlier. So, and I would have gone to the slush fund or whatever. I mean, if you're really crucial, I would have done, I would have yeah. jumped through hoops to keep you. Uh, and so I, it just felt cheap to me. And then on the me leaving side of things, and I've gotten counter offers and I'm like, you know, and a lot of times I'm people take advantage of my undervaluing myself. So I get low balled historically that's happened to me. Don't smirk Josh. But it's it's true, and then what? I, and then and then they then they just respond. I'm like, why didn't you respond earlier, right? Why didn't you just throw me a bone earlier? If I, you know, like, and you're valuable. They're like, we, we not just slush fund. We've talked. I've heard this. Oh, the CEO was like, yeah, here, whatever you want. Yeah. I'm like, I I busted my butt for three years, and I didn't know it's ever said a word. And you've nickel and dimed me, and now you do it. So it's like too late, I guess. It's, 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 it's sort of, I have a, my default reaction. One of them is too late. The other thing, since I'm a, I'm a boomer is trust. It's like, and I know this may not be fair for everyone, but I feel like it's broken trust, mm -hmm. right? You've broken trust is part of it. What about rehires? Um, I, I, so I worked for, a I worked for a company who remained nameless who um who would not who had a blacklist and if did you, you and left, I work together there no 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 not that company <laughs> <laughs> did they have a blacklist too but it, now all and this isn't funny actually this really bothered me but once you broke trust they would never rehire you yeah. it didn't matter if the mission vision if five years elapsed or whatever uh I don't think so Here's how I feel. I'm gonna, I will rehire folks. Now yeah. I will reset expectations. Let's say they they left. I wanna I wanna understand why they left. 
and then I want to correct that. But I have no issue. I am a hundred percent. If I can, if I can attract someone back to me, it's a huge win. Yeah, I consider agreed. it a huge win. Yeah. Uh, how do you feel, Josh? I agree completely, and I have lamented leaving places before, um, and I have had people that have left. They got there. They realized it wasn't exactly what they hoped, and you know, some oftentimes the grass is always greener. So the grass is greener over there. And then you get over there and you realize the grass is actually brown. They just spray painted it green. Exactly. You know, so you're like, oh, so this is who this group really is. And then you value the things that you had at a prior company. And unfortunately, there are some people that aren't even willing to open that discussion like, hey, I'd like to come back. But I found that there are really good companies that set that expectation when someone walks out the door. And they say, hey, listen, if you get out there, number one, we hope everything goes well. If it doesn't go well and you want to come back, we're here and we would love to have you back. So there are people that do a good job of setting that expectation up so that it's more welcoming and feels more comfortable for that person to bridge that gap of like, uh, hey, I think I made uh, a mistake. Absolutely. I mean, I, I can't tell you how excited I am about re as a leader when I was hiring I, how excited I was to be able to bring someone back. Yeah. Uh, and, it, but there are companies out there. It, it's the loyalty thing. They mm -hmm. really trigger. I've actually tried, and it's an informal blacklist. I've, I've, again, maybe it's historical. It probably has a historical nature to it, but I reapplied at companies. And, and then I found out, you know, they're never going to hire you no matter what, because you left. You, you showed disloyalty to the, to the company and you had the audacity to leave. So there's, there's some of that out there. Uh, I, I think it's the wrong thing. Yeah. Uh, Rob, Rob's mentioned something earlier. How do you, I just thought we could circle around and trust or talk about this. How do you know, verify you are being lowballed when applying for a job in different cities, industries, countries, et cetera? And I think someone answered do research and I would agree with that. Uh, there's a lot of data out there. So I wouldn't just look at, uh, for example, there's a scrum coaching and annual report on scrum coaches that has some salary data and it has uh, geographical data uh, associated with salaries. I know it's out there. They do an annualized and that's just one data point, but go, go there, uh, have connections to colleagues. This is where the, uh, the, like the scrum groups and things like that, the meetup groups can be useful. If you have some, some colleagues and things. Uh, you mentioned what glass door, Josh? Yeah, there, there's a there's a couple ways you can manage this. And what I've started to notice over the past couple of years is now that the workforce is available to every company across the country, things have started to level out where everybody's recognized now that I am competing with people that live in different with companies that are in different states, whereas before it was never a thing. And so now I've got to up my, my game. And so that, so that changes things a fair amount, but one of the best resources I've ever found is having a good relationship with a recruiting company or uh, an yeah, account yeah. manager there. Yeah. The, the uh, number of times where as a hiring manager, I call them and say, Hey, I'm hiring this new role. We haven't done this before. This is what I think is fair. Am I, off base what's going on and they'll say okay this is what we're seeing for the roles that we've hired we've hired n number of those in the past six months and it started here and it's up to here now so you're like at the peak price uh, so in both directions that's a great resource to have because they are in the business of matching people and getting them hired yep. and paid and of course they get paid more when the person that they help hire, help, help get hired, gets, gets paid more. So it's one of those things where that resource is there and they are on top of it because they want to know what's fair for their customers and what's fair for them. That's a really great point. I think, I, I think folks go to recruiters. It's like relationship building. Yeah. We don't do enough relationship building. You go to a recruiter when you need a job. I yeah, would say that's great. No, you should be establishing, you should have a recruiting universe of trusted recruiters and even if you don't need it, you should be able to go there and, and bounce off salary data, mm -hmm. uh, trend data from them, both local 
And then if you've left a city, let's say you've moved from New York to North Carolina, don't don't cut off those ties. Right. You may not be looking for work up there, but absolutely. Well, just like the young lady asked you, Josh, and it wasn't just Josh Anderson, you know, superstar develop or could have been, but she knows that you're tied into the industry. Yeah. Right. And and so you're a great resource for that question. So if you don't have anyone on your bench in your network with a relationship where you can go and get that kind of data, you need to find yeah. links to them. And I do want to circle back to her situation because we've we've pivoted unintentionally, but all good good topics on the leadership side of the house. But I want to talk about when you are the person and you believe you're being lowballed and what's going on and how you can tackle that. So the recommendation that I provided this, this person, because from, from their perspective, there was a difference between HR and the hiring manager. And I said, Hey, maybe it's just a mix up. Maybe the hiring manager didn't know this discussion happened and realizes, Oh crap. I thought you were here. I didn't know you were here. Let me work with yeah. HR. And it's just, it's just a mistake. I'm sorry. So just assume positive intent. Don't assume uh, they're trying to cheat you and go have that, that, that discussion of like, Hey, I'm confused throughout this process. I've talked and stated salary ranges here, but the offer came in here. Why? What's up with that? Uh, and then just get that. And oftentimes it will be that because people, again, want to extend a, like the, the last thing you want is to hire somebody and they come in grumpy on day one and you know it, like that's just not going to go well. So that was step one. And then it came back and the hiring manager's like, nope, we're not budging. So then they were like, all right, what do I do? And then that discussion. So this would be interesting to hear from Bob on what happens. What should you do when that happens, when it comes back? significant en enough I got, where you have I that got discussion. You. So I'm going to do something Metacasters that I almost never do. I'm going to, so the first part of Josh's uh, answer was, or response to that young lady was uh, assume positive intent and all of those words he used around it. He nailed it. I am in all of your intellect, Mr. Anderson. Yes. So he nailed that. So I, I violently agreed with him. Now on the second part, to say, what would I do? Um, so the scenario is I want 50 or I want a hundred and they're offering me 70 Yeah, sure. or something like that. Yeah. And they're, and they're not going to budge. Mm -hmm. Um, probably eight times out of 10, I would walk away. Yeah. Uh, the two times I might stay is if I'm starving. Um, if I'm, you know, if I really need the money, uh, then I would take it. Uh, I would probably not even stop my job search. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm not trying to, I'm trying to be fair, but I would take the money, uh, not stop my job search. Uh, but if I wasn't desperate or if I wasn't desperate, you know, if I wasn't in straits that I really needed, I'd walk away. Yeah. Uh, Cause they broke my, you know, if it was maybe 5k, Josh, there's a slight number that I would, but this is a this is a chasm to me. It's a yeah. chasm, and there's no negotiation. It's like take it or leave it. That whole notion of take it or leave it, uh, from a pe treating people point of view, how it, to me that's this leading indicator that you all uh, don't understand leadership and people and motivation and rewards and things like that. And I'm not gonna I'm not gonna join it. Yeah, and now 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 evaluate my response because you had this twinkle in your eye. Well, so, I was just excited did, to hear what you were going to say. Uh, I would fight for that 5,000, um, but that's okay. Uh, <laughs> exactly. Because, because you want to arm wrestle more? Like, hey, like, what, I listen is this to you. really going to break your bank? You know? Yeah, um, yeah that's, but, my, that's my man. I know. So, you, yeah. But what we did when this came back is like, hey, they aren't going to budge. I just started asking about how she felt and how they felt about the company. And would you be okay? Would you be excited like you were last week? Yeah. And it was one of those things where this person wanted out of the current job and had gotten to the point of frustration where it's like, well, it's good enough. 
And I said, no, it's not good enough. Don't treat yourself like that. You, you aren't in the one example that Bob has where you're starving. You just need the money. You have a good job that pays well. You don't like it as much as you would like, but so you're trying to find something better unless it's clearly better. Don't take it and keep looking. And that's how things went. But the reason it got there, the reason she was able to get there was because she did go back and have that discussion. It yeah. wasn't just a frustration, a power play or anything. It was, they got on common ground and everybody understood both sides and they got on common ground about the situation. They weren't on common ground about the outcome that was right. expected. So once this person acquired all of the info, then they could make a real decision as opposed to there've been times in my career and probably many of you where you're like, well, you know, it's 100 and I think it should be 110 and you don't have a leg to stand on. You just believe that, right? So Bob, Bob talked about some of the folks that just value themselves higher. And maybe that's the thing. They don't have the research to back it up. They haven't proven that, that the market will bear that, that, that value or that rate. So they just go in and make a decision. A thing that I, that came to me, Josh too, and this is, I do think we have to be empathetic. Let's say I'm inside a company or even as a, even as someone who's uh, interviewing um, to the internal dynamics. So it's not all about me, right? And this isn't, I'm not joking about me understanding my worth or not, but it's understanding the, the landscape inside a company. Let's say I join a company and they stretch, they use that slush fund that you were talking about, Josh, but now you have a responsibility. Let's say 10 engineers on your staff are underpaid and you need to do salary adjustments and you have limited funding. So now the superstar Bob who got paid at whatever, I got paid you know, above market rates, great, which is I deserved. But now I need to, I need to look a little bit beyond myself and say, you know what? I may not get a, a really heavy hitter increase. It's just, is it is, don't sports guys do this? The uh, Tom Brady, oh, I hate, I hate Tom Brady, but, but I'll use Tom, but didn't Tom Brady give some of his salary back or he yeah. deferred it longer term so that there was more flexibility to bring in other people. So I wanted to bring this nuance. It's not, damn it. Even in today's generations, don't make it all about you. Look, look at the dynamics, be considerate or empathetic to the dynamics in the company. Don't, don't be cheated. What do you think about that? Um, oh, I know what you, I, I can, I would, okay. I would like to retort here with that. Okay. Uh, yes. Tom, Tom Brady and some other <laughs> significantly well-paid people have reduced <laughs> their hundred million salary to By $5. 5 million. You know, yes, <laughs> that has happened. Um, but the argument that I make to a lot of people in the world that we live in, not in the Tom Brady world, but the world that we live in is that. Is that no the real one, world, Josh? It's the world we live in, however you want to okay. label it. No one is going to fight for your own value more than you. The only way would be if you were to go and get an agent like Tom Brady has that earns 15% of whatever he makes. In the world that we live in, there, there aren't many people like that. Now there's recruiters that get paid a bit more, so they're going to fight, but also they're fighting with their customer. So that's a delicate balance they have to play of trying to get you paid as much as possible, but also not becoming that vendor that that customer doesn't like to work with because you're always bringing these very expensive people and that becomes a problem. But the argument that I make and why I'm so passionate about this is no one's going to do it for you. You have to fight for you. If you don't fight for you, who's going to do it? And so, yes. that, so that's why I'm so heavy handed and strong about this thing of trying to get people more comfortable and confident and willing to have the discussion. Yes. And, but you're also saying, screw everyone else. It's all about me when I join the company, right? Uh, I, I hope you say no. I do, the problem is you screw don't know. them all. The problem is you don't know. So I, all right. I, I, so I disagree with that. I if, think if, we, but, forget the Tom Brady and the today and all of the other crap. 
Yes, it's 80%. I'll use percentages to make the point. Mm -hmm. Maybe 80% I have to fight for myself. But I don't want to be so darn self-centric that I miss the dynamics in a company. I'm mean, not looking. Or if I look and I discover it and I say, I don't care, right? I don't care about everyone else. I'm being equitable. I'm being above market paid and no one else on my team is. And I don't give a shit. I don't, I, I personally don't like that. It doesn't have to end that way. You could be the catalyst that gets everybody the bump that they deserve, that gets people to understand this is how this role is valued as of right now. And we have five other people that are like that. So it yes, doesn't it, have to but, end up that way. But there's constraints and it could take a year or two, as you know, mm -hmm. for budgets to work out that way. And so I might take one for the team there. Again, I'm. it's a balancing act, but it's the vision. It's like, do I care? Do I have a, I don't even know what to call it. Do I have a balanced, mature, not just me centric attitude about things. And this is a company I want to be a part of, mm -hmm. right? I like the company. I, I, maybe I'm, maybe I'm articulating. I it's this money centricity over team dynamics, over, uh, fairness, equity, things like that. I understand. And I agree with you. I, I just keep coming back to, this is the single lever you have in the process. You cannot yeah. push a lever to change the culture. Now, if that conversation were to go, and I've had this conversation with people and they've walked away, understandably so, of like, okay, you you come in and you're asking for 120 and I really paying people that have been here, poured everything they have into it that are just as skilled, just as experienced as you and I'm paying them 100. I am not going to cheat them. I am not going to pay you 120 and them 100. And we've had that that discussion of is there a middle ground where I can get you that I'm confident I can get those seven other people to. So yep. I've had that that discussion as a leader, and then that's the moment where I, as the person being hired, I have to figure out how much do I bet on this person making that happen? And because yeah. if they make that happen, that is 100% yep. a person I want to work with and a company I want to be at. Yep. So it's there, but I, I just aspire for more people to grab that lever and not get nervous and take their hands off of it. So if that was a piece of roadkill on the road of life, in the in the world it is now flattened josh <laughs> you you made that point it has become part it's it's become part of molecularly part of the road yes <laughs> so i'm uh, passionate so about it what can I, say? I i can and and i'm not and and you know what i i'm i'm supportive i'm i'm supportive of that and this is our generational dynamics coming into play i think yeah. a little bit but I'm not arguing against what people, people should be paid their worth, damn it, right? Uh, they should be offered their worth. They should be maintained their, what, what they're worth. And, um, and, 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 and I don't think people should be made to feel guilty for getting paid what they're worth. Correct. Correct. Or, or nickel and dimed or yeah. lowballed or all of that stuff. Steven said something earlier. He said, I think that's part of Bob's point. As a leader, you are the agent for your team. I don't want to amplify the Bob's point, even though I love anyone who agrees with me. Uh, but he, he made the point, you are the agent for your, not for the, for the team. Mm -hmm. So as leaders, so the individual is an agent for themselves, primarily, and that's where you're going. I think as leaders, we need to have that holistic view of what's going on for the team and every part of the dynamic. Right. right. And, and then having our phil, uh, philosophy of, you know, equi whatever we're trying to do, I want to do everything possible to keep good people and to grow them. Amen. So are we done? Did we I mean, cover this? I could talk about this for a lot longer, but then we would have crushed it. So, so fast forward, I, I'm just curious, end it this way, the young lady, so she stayed? Did she, what did she uh, do? She did not accept that role. Okay. And has since found a role that she is much more excited about with. So, so she with kept the, the job. So she said no. Yep. So she followed my advice. Mm -hmm. 
she <laughs> she did <laughs> she said no uh you know just kidding yeah she I, said no and she stayed in her current role mm -hmm. uh but kept the job search going yep. and she had and did, did not very get out. excited it's, very very excited i gotta see text. that's 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 yeah. the damn that's one of the points you said it earlier i want people forget the salaries i mean the salaries are the part i want people to come in excited right i want them to, i mean i want people to feel like they hit the freaking lottery right I, any hiring leader people should feel like they hit the damn lottery otherwise what what are you getting on day one yeah you're you're, you're getting someone who feels like you cheated them mm -hmm. what's up with that what do you want that no all right we done yeah let's do it okay I, from beautiful downtown Cary, north carolina i'm bob galen and equally as beautiful Fuquay Verena, North Carolina. I'm Josh Anderson. Shake and bake. Take care, y'all. <laughs>